Good, af good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My, my name is Silvestre Arana. I am the head of the energy practice at Garrigues, which is a, a Spanish law firm. Um, I am very proud today and delighted to present a number of very, very relevant speakers. The first of them is, sorry for that, Mr. Barry Barton. I guess you already know him, uh, so I can make a very brief introduction, but basically I, I'm sure that each of you know him very well. He's a professor of law at the University of Waikato in New Zealand. And, please, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvester, and, and uh, thank you for uh, the organizers at the club, and thank you to our uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Inigo Dugawail, for uh, welcoming us uh, to Spain. Uh, thank you for your tolerance in, in uh, putting up with me speaking in English uh, rather than Spanish. Uh, uh, I am presenting this paper on behalf of myself and my co-author Jennifer Campion here, um, who will uh, fill in the gaps uh, uh, that I leave in uh, what I say. Uh, what I, what I uh, want to focus on essentially is the legal framework for uh, making climate change policy, and I find it ties in very strongly with the remarks of our previous speaker, Professor Moreno. Uh, so I hope I am not repeating, but I am seeing extraordinarily strong linkages between uh, my thinking and yours. So uh, uh, that's two of us that are right, uh, at least. <laughs> Um, so, essentially, the, 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 uh, if we think about policy issues that governments and policy makers and uh, the advisors of people in industry and, and lawyers face, uh, climate change presents special problems. Uh, and first of all, that climate change is a, is a long-term problem and targets are typically set for 2040 and 2050. Now, that doesn't fit well with the political cycle, uh, where politicians are preoccupied at the most with the next election uh, or, you know, this week's press releases. So, uh, uh, we have a, a, a difficulty there about how to make good policy. Um, secondly, uh, we have difficulties in connecting, in many countries, the international uh, progress with national progress. Uh, and obviously, in, in your case, in Spain, there is the EU dimension as well. Uh, so uh, how to get domestic policy action. Uh, in many ways, we make the assumption that much of the change that needs to be made is at the, uh, at the national level. Uh, there are the supranational levels. Uh, and there are also uh, activities at the municipal and the uh, private sector uh, spheres. Uh, we do not ignore that, but the, the role of the nation state uh, cannot be uh, underestimated. Thirdly, the breadth, the, 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 the width, uh, the, 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 the number of different sectors of the economy and of society that are affected by climate change and where we must get change uh, if we are to make progress. Uh, and as Professor Moreno has has explained, uh, there are the questions of energy supply, uh, but also energy demand, energy uh, demand side management, energy efficiency, uh, behavior, uh, and technology, all of which must come together. Fourthly, that it depends very much on, on sound information and sound analysis. Um, we can ask what is the best technology for, uh, for, or what is the best policy, and there are huge numbers of policy options, uh, and that's from the International Energy Agency. Um, and the question is, which of all those policies, this, this smorgasbord of possibilities, which of them is the best? And it will vary from country to country, from region to region. Um, but if we choose the wrong ones, then we may spend prodigious amounts of money uh, 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 give concern to investors about investment certainty and not get any change on climate change. Uh, so uh, we understand you have had your problems here in relation to feed-in tariffs. Uh, that is a problem that others have faced too. 
uh, how to uh, find economical, what are the most economical ways of making progress. So uh, what are our political and policy making institutions for making sure we, we, we choose the right things? Uh, essentially, uh, our proposition is this, that if we have well-designed laws, they will shape the policy process. So well-designed laws uh, hopefully will make it easy for politicians to make good policy. Or if you think about it in, co in reverse sense, if the, if the law is a mess, then it won't contribute to doing good policy. We want to make it easy for people to do the right thing. Uh, uh, so uh, you know, it is essentially a plea, if you like, that uh, law does make a difference. Uh, and uh, we would emphasize that our, our interest, uh, this is neutral on what the content of the climate change policy should be, whether it's uh, emissions trading scheme versus taxes, uh, direct regulation, uh, etc., etc. Never mind all that, but how do we make the decisions about that? Um, and that law can uh, shape the way that that works. And in fact, we have many other examples in our political systems where law and policy interact, where law shapes policy and policy shapes law. So, for example, on our national a budgeting on an annual basis, that is done on a basis of a set of laws, uh, some of it set by the legislature, some of it set in statute, that shapes how that important process of making a budget is done. It should be the same for climate change. So uh, we, we identify five elements that we see as desirable in laws and uh, for um, policy in this area. And the first is targets. Uh, after Paris, everyone has a target, but we should ask lawyer-type questions about it. Uh, is it enshrined in legislation? And then even if it is enshrined in legislation, what is its legal effect? What consequences does it have? You know, uh, for example, on an emissions trading scheme. You know, does the emissions trading scheme limits, the cap, have to coordinate with the, with the target. One would hope that they do. That's the whole point of it. But in fact, if we look at our legislation in many countries, they do not coordinate. There is no legal connection. We need that. Uh, secondly, we need instruments uh, that will uh, uh, provoke early action and deal with that timing problem. It's all very good to have the politicians setting a target for 2040, uh, but uh, by that date they will be dead and buried politically, if not uh, biologically. Um, and uh, so we need to see what is happening in the meantime. Um, and one powerful tool uh, is carbon budgeting, so as to uh, establish what would be needed for successive periods, uh, such as five-year periods. Uh, and the British, with their Climate Change Act, are doing a lot of this. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a, a valuable um, example to study. Um, they also set up a climate change committee, but I think this is more important. For the, the next five years, how much progress must be made, the five years after that, how much progress must be made, and so forth. And that all has to stay below the line that will get to the target in 2040. So you can tell early on if you are going to reach the target. Okay? So, uh, we need that or something like that to translate the long term into short term action. Thirdly, we must make sure that the, that the general targets are supported by policies and measures. Professor Moreno again, that uh, it is not good enough to have broad ranging airy fairy targets uh, unless they are supported by policy actions or policies and measures that have a real likelihood of achieving them. And that might sound obvious, but if you look at what's happening in many countries, that is what we find. And in a way, what this is, is, is essentially suggesting that we write laws that will help our politicians stay honest. Okay? So that if they set a target or a goal, then we, they also have to supply the means through which those targets will be achieved. Fourthly, uh, that the targets and other objectives uh, be relevant to all relevant decision makers. And one simple question one can ask is, what is the jurisdiction of the energy regulator? What is the authority of the energy regulator? What is the obligation 
of the energy regulator to take climate change uh, objectives into account. Um, uh, one example that is very good is California, uh, but there are many other examples uh, and a quick survey of, of provinces in Canada, sorry Al, um, uh, showed, show that uh, the, the uh, provincial utility commissions have virtually no obligation in most cases to take into account climate change. Uh, uh, targets, and that can't be right. So it's a question of legal design. Finally, information and analysis. Obviously, there is a lot of work going on in statistics and information, but that has to be converted into monitoring and um, and analysis of policy. So if there is a policy proposal, we need to ask how many kilotons or megatons of carbon dioxide GHG emissions will that save? We, we need that analysis and we need to ask what will the cost be? Is that the most cost efficient method of obtaining that reduction? And certainly the, the auction systems uh, 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 described in Latin America have advantages <laughs> there. They can be set up so that they are technology neutral. We don't care what technology you use. If you can offer to make a reduction of this many tons of emissions, then that's good enough. So uh, again, there are examples there. Uh, and uh, at times and in some places, it is desirable to have institutional segregation so that there is an autonomous process of analysis and reporting. It doesn't just depend on the minister. So there's our conclusion. Uh, good laws, good processes, good institutions uh, uh, can help to make better politics and better policy, uh, and that should improve efficiency and effectiveness, uh, uh, should maintain investment certainty, uh, provide clarity about what regulators are doing, not just in the short term, but in the midterm and the long term. Thank you. speaker is uh, Professor Alistair Lucas from the, sorry for that, um, he needs to, he needs to, Okay, uh, buenas tardes, todos. Uh, I will be presenting in English, however. Uh, my presentation uh, is closely related to uh, Barry's, but my colleague, uh, Chidinma Thompson, uh, who is uh, a partner with the Canadian law firm of uh, 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 Borden and Ladner Gervais in Calgary, we've taken a bit of a different tack to this. That is, we focused on the idea that there is a transition toward lower carbon energy economies. And that this can be observed if you look at it globally, and if you look at it nationally, and even if you start to look at subnational entities like provinces and, and states. And uh, this is a trend that is in motion right now and actually has been in motion for, for a considerable amount of time. There, there is nothing new about this. And uh, the evidence uh, is in Barry's remarks, in Professor Moreno's uh, remarks. You can see the transition occurring. So. Our approach was to ask what is the role of law, or to put it as Barry did, law does make, law can make a difference. We could perhaps write a song, Barry, <laughs> though someone else would have to perform it. <laughs> so these, these are the factors that we've uh, uh, taken into account in thinking about this idea of a uh, a transition to a lower carbon uh, energy economy. 
there are technology issues, uh, the idea of innovation, about which our group has had a lot of discussion uh, over the last few days, um, uh, capital and, and policy development, um, much in the way that, that Barry described policy development, a sort of messy policy development. Hydrocarbon fuels continue to be available and continue to be available cheaply in most uh, parts of the, uh, of the globe. But at the same time, the cost of renewable energy has continued to fall. And we are seeing in many places renewable uh, energy uh, getting to the point where it is a serious competitor with uh, hydrocarbon energy. We're seeing that in, uh, in my province, in, in Alberta, the uh, cost of wind energy, for example, Alberta is a good place for wind, uh, is, is rapidly approaching the, uh, uh, the same cost picture as, as hydrocarbon fuels. Then there are the environmental risks, and, and the big environmental risk, of course, is the matter of climate change. Okay, and we're, see, we're seeing responses to that uh, in, uh, at the international level and then um, implementation responses uh, in, in governments in different ways in different countries. And that's so the international relations uh, bullet there refers to the international climate change regime. So these are factors that we, that we looked at. And this is what we got to. The, the idea that this transition is taking place, and there's been considerable discussion about it, a fair bit of research and publication of results, but nearly all of this research has been in the fields of economics, uh, public policy, political science and the like, uh, and public administration, but there's been virtually nothing written in this area about law, about these issues, that is, the issues looked at this way. So we said what we need to do is try to identify what the legal issues are and cre create an agenda of legal issues. And they might be in the nature of, uh, of barriers to moving along this low carbon um, energy uh, track. They may be in the nature of, of legal instruments or legal approaches that can be used to facilitate the movement along that low carbon energy track. We didn't set out to solve all these problems. That is going to take a, a much longer time, and it's going to require uh, research on a, on, in a number of areas on, on a number of issues. So ours is the very first step. We're asking what the problems are, what are the issues, and hence the idea of, uh, uh, of a legal agenda. And being a bunch of academics, of course, we had to, uh, we had to think about uh, theory. So uh, we, we needn't discuss this in great detail in this forum, but uh, we did think about the idea of rule of law, for example, and you could see that in uh, coming out in Barry's presentation, the idea that governments are very good about rolling out policies, making announcements. This is what we intend to do. This is our policy. But policies ultimately can't be enforced, right? So they have to be implemented through legal means. And that's this, this idea, at least, at least in, in, um, in common law, of the, uh, of the rule of law. And then uh, on, on the uh, climate change side, the idea of uh, ecological integrity, uh, resiliency, both in, in terms of the physical environment, but also in, in terms of, of social environments. Uh, when you look at, at what is necessary uh, globally and what is necessary in different uh, countries to uh, address uh, climate change. So those are sort of the, some of the underlying values that we thought were important when we approached uh, this idea of a, a legal agenda. And here too, 
uh, at the international level, as, as I've mentioned, climate change, the climate change regime. At the national level, that's the, that's the implementation, the, the legislating of the um, uh, uh, climate change uh, requirements. And then subnational, that's where you get down to provinces and states. Uh, at the international level, issues of sovereignty, uh, and, and uh, what states do, what states are prepared to do, and then how they do it in terms of, of actually legislating uh, uh, climate change requirements, those targets that, uh, that Barry Barton was, was talking about a few minutes ago, for example. At the um, national level, uh, countries like Canada that are federations encounter uh, a set of potential barriers to low carbon energy futures uh, in, in the sense that uh, jurisdiction to address the legal issues is going to be divided between the central government and the, the states or provinces. And we have had that problem in spades in Canada. And many issues have come to be decided through lengthy litigation that ends up in the Supreme Court of Canada and basically slows down and some, sometimes has, has, has the effect of, in, of entirely changing the course of a uh, uh, policy development and then legal implementation on, on different issues. So that's, that's an issue that needs to be faced, that is constitutional constraints. Some, some issues, in fact, go beyond the federalism side of things and uh, enter the um, uh, enter the realm of constitutional uh, rights, constitutionally protected rights, in 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 terms of uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of bills of uh, of bills of rights and um, constitutional protections of rights of citizens and and indirectly of of corporations. Um, we've noted indigenous rights and title, and that is an issue certainly in Canada, and it's an issue in many other countries that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, in Canada, indigenous, indigenous rights have been enshrined in the Constitution. So we, we have this issue at really another level than, than other countries do. And then finally, at the level of, um, of statute law. So drivers, potential role of law, legal constraints. So potential liability, substantive and procedural. You can think about that in the regulatory context. Uh, uh, you can think about, uh, uh, about issues that regulators need to deal with. You can think about opposition to proposals. Uh, for, for example, to uh, wind farms and other kinds of, uh, uh, of renewable energy proposals. That, that have to be sorted out and, and dealt with by regulators and can often find their way into the courts. Those are legal issues. So those are public law issues. Uh, again, using the, using the example of wind farms, issues can be private law as well. So that where a wind farm is proposed and you live next door, there may very well be problems with, with noise and disruption as a result of the wind farm development that may result in uh, private law uh, actions in the courts. So both public law and private law, we're adding that to, uh, to our agenda. Uh, the idea of uh, national planning, and this picks up on, Barry, on Barry's presentation, that is re uh, reducing uh, uh, public policy to laws and to, to laws that are actually effective legislating uh, targets so that they can be enforced instead of simply announcing them. Those are, those are legal issues that, that must be addressed. And um, there, there are other issues. We, you, you can think about this as a, as a list that can grow and can, be, and can be added to. So this slide s simply shows some, some additional um, issues. So uh, renewable uh, energy uh, legislation. In, in, certainly in Canada and in other countries, you can see this in Latin America as well, 
there will be legislation on, on oil and gas law, there will be legislation on mining law, there might be legislation specifically on hydroelectricity, but uh, do you find legislation on wind energy? Do you find uh, specific and detailed uh, legislation on solar energy? Probably not. Okay, so there's a gap there that ideally ought to be addressed. And this, this follows, I think, from, uh, from Barry's presentation. I've noted intellectual property and international trade as, as potentially producing uh, legal issues. So um, innovative developments in uh, renewable uh, energy, right, that produce intellectual property. You're into the intellectual property regime. Again, a set of legal issues there. Uh, those, those same uh, intellectual property developments may be uh, exported or imported, depending on where you are. You, so you're into international trade and the legal uh, context and the specific uh, 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 trade law requirements. Okay, so you can add that to the, uh, to the legal um, agenda. So in, in conclusion, it's a list of this kind that we have tried to, to prepare. To, to, simp to, to demonstrate that there is a set of legal issues that, that are important and that actually need to be addressed in thinking about this idea of a low carbon uh, uh, energy uh, transition. And if they're not addressed, I think Barry and I t are together uh, on the conclusion that if they're not addressed, problems will arise, delays will happen, and in, in some areas, perhaps, we will never get to where we would like to get to. So I'll stop with that. Our next, our next speaker is Professor Olawi. I hope I haven't spelled it uh, absolutely wrong. <laughs> From the University of Doha, and he will be speaking about the energy transition in Qatar. Good evening. Um, I think we've, we've received very important information about the evidence of low carbon transition in, in, in Colombia, um, in Canada, in New Zealand. And I thought it might be useful to tell you what's been going on in the Middle East as well. Um, we all know that the Middle East is home to some of the um, highest producers of oil and gas in the world. Um, the state of Qatar, where I live, is the third largest exporter of natural gas in the world. Um, Saudi Arabia, one of the largest exporters of oil in the world. Um, but lately, we, we, we noticed increasingly that these oil and gas producing countries began to flung their doors, I mean, be, began to fling their, their doors open to, to um, renewable energy as well. And, and, and it gave some of us um, researchers, um, um, it, it picked our interest to say, why are these countries suddenly interested in, in renewable energy? And um, I'll be going through um, um, what has been happening, um, why we think it has been happening, and how these developments can be um, supported by law um, to make them even more formidable, if we can put it that way. Um, so like I mentioned earlier on, um, the GCC countries, um, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, Saudi Arabia, have lately begun to show increasing interest in renewable energy. Um, the, the Kuwait National Vision of 2035 um, clearly laid out Kuwait's plan to generate 15% of its electricity from renewable energy by the year 2035. The Qatar National Vision of 2030 states 
almost the same, 20% electricity by the year 2030. Saudi Arabia national vision of 2030 um, says, um, well, by 2030, um, we would hope to produce 30% of the kingdom's electricity um, through renewable energy. Same for the Oman national vision of 2030. So increasingly, there's been a, a buzz in investment and in, in, in activities, really, in renewable energy. Um, some of these countries, as you'd see in the slides, have committed significant amount of dollars um, to renewable energy infrastructure um, and, and also in, in welcoming um, renewable energy developers and innovators to come in and invest in renewable energy. Um, and so the, the, the first question, like I said, is why, why the sudden change um, in attitude? Number two, um, how can these visions, um, these, these robust visions really, how can they be uh, moved from mere visions to, to reality? Um, as we know, um, for an oil and gas dependent country, suddenly transiting to another form of energy will definitely not be as easy um, as just um, releasing visions. Some things have to be done in terms of legal innovations to make sure those visions are realistic. Um, and thirdly, um, I'm asking what lessons can we learn from e you know, European countries that have done this in the past, for example, United Kingdom, um, Germany, and, and also in North America, the United States, um, that have uh, at least achieved some sort of um, renewable energy electricity. What can we learn in the Middle East um, from these jurisdictions? I'll, I'll, I'll go through these three questions very quickly. So number one, the, the drive, number, the, the first reason for this change in attitude is a, a significant rise in electricity demand in the region. Um, due to, of course, increased investment activities going on in these countries, there's been a rise, a sudden surge in population, leading to a rise, a geometric rise as well, in electricity demand. For example, Qatar has moved from a country of about 200,000 citizens to a country of about 2 million residents just over the last few years. And with that sudden jump in population came a sudden jump in peak electricity demand. So as a, as a way of responding to this jump, um, GCC countries are realizing that there's a need to um, tap into alternative form, forms of electricity, electricity as well. Number two is, of course, the big one, the fall in the prices of oil. Um, large spending GCC countries have seen a huge eat um, in their um, spending powers lately due to the drop in the price of oil. And with OPEC saying that the, a, a, a price of $100 per barrel may not happen again until the year 2040, then GCC countries have realized that, well, we better start diversifying the economy to move from monoculture economies that are so dependent on oil and gas to start generating some form of investment in, in renewable energy, innovation, technology. So this is a second driver. This is another reason why there's been a large release of visions on, on transition. A third um, reason is um, the, the problem of climate change. Many countries talk about climate change, um, um, but for the Middle East, climate change is more than just an academic issue. It's a serious concern that could shut down the entire region. And that's because even without climate change, the Middle East is, is of course, one of the, the hottest regions in the world. And with climate change, with um, increasing temperature, the Middle East might, might shut down. And so governments in the region have realized that we need to respond to climate change. We need to lower the emission of greenhouse gases that cause climate change. Um, we need to commit to climate change, and that's why many GCC countries were quick to, to sign the Paris Agreement. Some have even ratified it and are making concrete efforts to combat climate change. Um, these three reasons have, have been the main, reason, uh, have been the main uh, um, uh, drivers of that um, low energy transition. But as Middle Eastern countries begin to show interest in renewable energy, we notice that um, the, there's, this, there's an urgent need as well to back um, that appetite for renewable energy uh, with policy, with law, with, with concrete um, clarity, concrete um, legislative clarity, if we can put it that way. As um, Al and Barry mentioned, um, visions, policies, 
cannot be enforced. We need law that can be enforced, especially if you want investors to come in and be part of this. I also like what Milton Friedman, a, a, a U.S. economist, said in the past that one of the greatest mistakes is to judge policies by their intentions rather than their results. Until when we begin to achieve concrete results in terms of the low energy transition in the Middle East, it will all still remain just mere visions and aspirations. Um, so I argue very strongly that there's a, an urgent need for us to back those visions with laws and pol with laws and concrete governance structures. Um, as we can see in so, so I investigate and I try to analyze what are the key things that have been done in, in jurisdictions that have um, successfully moved from mere visions to um, concrete action. And I, I saw that three things are very important, and GCC countries would have to start implementing these three things. The first is, of course, the need for a clear and transparent legislative framework. For example, in Germany, there is a renewable energy law. In, in, in the UK, there, there, there are laws that back this renewable energy electricity. But it, my survey of all GCC countries shows that none have <coughs> renewable energy laws. So it's just all visions, visions with no law. And while I was in, um, in the practice of law, and I know that you would agree with me, investors like to see more than visions. They love, uh, they love to see laws that would back their investments up. Um, if I come, um, if I bring my technology, um, is there any law protecting my, my technology? So in, um, GCC countries will have to, to do that uh, as a matter of urgency. Um, number two, again, is that you know, many of these visions state very clearly that we need the technical know-how of foreign investors. Even though the money is there, we still need that technical know-how. So those plans are heavily dependent on foreign participation, foreign investment, especially for the technical know-how. Um, but then when you want to drive a policy agenda based on public-private partnership, there is a need for a public-private partnership law as well that would clearly state how those investments or technologies will be protected. My survey of GCC countries also show that only Kuwait has a PPP law. Um, Dubai very recently, um, a, a city develop a PPP law, but many of the other countries like Qatar, where I teach, do not, I mean, does not have a PPP law. Oman does not have a PPP law. And I see that as a, as a big problem in terms of trying to attract PPP investment or even private sector participation from foreign jurisdictions. A third issue is um, the need to also incentivize and encourage small-scale renewable energy producers. Um, in, in, in Europe, uh, this feed-in tariff system has been used to, you know, encourage and incentivize small-scale renewable energy producers, and I, um, and, and I think that's a significant lesson that we can learn in the Middle East as well, um, in terms of trying to encourage private sector investors. For example, Qatar Foundation, a private um, entity in Qatar, has invested a lot on solar energy. Um, there are other private entities that have done as well uh, that have done that as well, but again, there is no incentive system to encourage them um, to, to even take it further. And if we must achieve this low carbon energy transition, small scale renewable energy systems will play a very significant um, role. So, well, I believe that um, we need to move from mere policies and visions to action. And we hope that um, our continuing investigation of these issues will lead us to where we need to be. Shukran. Thank you. Well, many thanks to all of you. Um, I guess if anybody has a, a question or a comment, uh, please feel free. Go ahead, please. Do you need a micro or? No. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's actually a short comment to, uh, and maybe invitation to comment on that from uh, to um, uh, Demi Lola. I've seen that the uh, targets that have been adopted in the region are expressed in terms of generation. And that's something that is different from the approach in Europe, which uh, are shared in terms of consumption 
which is also reflects very much the structure of the European uh, electricity energy system. But because expressing in terms of generation is very strong in terms of commitment. Mm. That was <laughs> just to stress the difference of approach. Maybe okay. In targets. Okay. So t you mean ta um, targets based on generation? I see. Thank you very much. One of the main achievements by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal was to reintroduce and emphasize the importance of mitigation and adaptation to climate change, especially for those countries that are on the ocean, the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean and the less developed countries. So taking into account that United Nations was clear and straight that low carbon transition energy efficient economies and adaptation to climate change is paramount how can the international community can introduce those values and those goals into their national legal frames considering that there is a wide gap between not only donor countries or developed economies but also in terms of geographical position for many countries for example new zealand and qatar are so vulnerable to an ocean ri uh, level of, uh, rise. But in the case of Canada, perhaps uh, their most vulnerable aspect regards to the recent Donald Trump's administration uh, push in order to make a reform, a sustainable reform that could introduce the Keystone oil pipe once again into the Congress and Senate agenda. Thank you. Well, perhaps to start, uh, when it comes to uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation, Professor Olawi is on top of this. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, this, was, this was his PhD work. So. As long as you don't ask me. Right? <laughs> so, so I guess the question is, um, what are these countries doing in terms of climate change mitigation and adaptation? when there is still investment in, in oil and gas and oil pipelines? Is that, is that the question? Well, um, I, I totally agree. Um, and, I, and I know that what you have in mind, which um, I, I can tell, is that some countries think climate change is not even real, and we know that president and, and that country. <laughs> but so, so you're very right that different countries with different views, um, but the reality is that some countries are already being affected by climate change. Um, if we go to um, islands in, in Tuvalu and Kiribati, and even if we go to low-lying countries in, in, in many parts of Africa, they will tell you that climate change is already here. And, and so, and, and we've always, as scholars in international environmental law, we've always believed that we should be guided by the precautionary principle, which is if we do think there's a risk of something happening, then we should take um, efforts to at least address um, that thing and, and, you know, lack of scientific certainty should not be a reason why we should defer action. And I think that is the reasonable approach to take with respect to climate change. Um, for example, in the Middle East, we think, th we think um, climate change is, is already there. And um, it's difficult to, 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 get to farm. It's difficult for agriculture to thrive in the Middle East. And, and so imagine if it gets even hotter or even if it gets more difficult. So I believe that the approach, you know, governments in every country should take that approach of saying, well, even if we cannot attain 100% certainty, we should um, do something about climate change. Uh, and, and that's something, something is not difficult. It's um, the whole world has come together. You know, the whole world has adopted the Paris Agreement. It gives us gives us some insights on what we can do um, to address climate change. 
perhaps the other uh, part of the question or another part of your question is what, what I'll call uh, American destabilization. This, this is the phenomenon we face in Canada, and I think uh, c uh, countries elsewhere in the world uh, on, on these issues we're discussing face as well. Uh, we can't even figure out what the policies are. We get lots of announcements, uh, early morning Twitter uh, uh, information, uh, but to try, to try to figure out what the policy directions actually are, and much less try to figure out what uh, legislative changes might actually emerge in the United States. There's just a great deal of uncertainty there, and we happen to be living next door to it, but it, it affects uh, countries uh, globally. Thank you for your question. And can I perhaps uh, just bring in some of the work of the colleagues who unfortunately weren't able to be uh, at this seminar? And that is that integral to the work that we're looking at are issues of energy poverty and the effect of the Sustainable Development Goals. And indeed, we have several chapters in the book that we are looking at that deal with these questions. So. It is very much on the agenda of the academic advisory group to be concerned with climate justice issues, with the impacts at an adapt, um, and the need for adaptation. And I think one of the interesting things that that question uh, brought forward is that um, adaptation and mitigation were once seen as sort of separate ideas. I think one of the really interesting things that I think is a factor in energy transition is this convergence between adaptation and mitigation. And for many countries, um, for Australia is acutely aware of its, uh, its neighbours in the Pacific and the impacts of sea level rise there, and indeed even within Australia itself. So that we are actually seeing adaptation as a driver then of, if you like, transition and, and mitigation. Um, so I just wanted to to make it very clear that the Sustainable Development Goals are very much on the agenda and that uh, we, are, we are seeing a range of these. The other thing that I could just put into the mix is while public international law frameworks are very important, one of, I think, the, the moves that um, <clears throat> we were talking about with the, if you like, the Trump destabilization is a move to augment the public international frameworks with private action and, for example, the advent of climate litigation, the work of non-government organisations in bringing, for example, uh, litigation against governments who fail to put into effect um, policy and targets that are, are reasonable in terms of their potential to address uh, climate change. So we're actually seeing a diversification across the legal spectrum of these drivers towards uh, addressing the complex problems. Right, right at the back. Thank you. Hello. Thanks to the three speakers for the very interesting presentations. I have a question addressed to Mr. Barton uh, regarding the, uh, one of the elements you explained about making well-designed laws that will help to, uh, to implement better the policies in this, in this field. Uh, regarding the four elements you explained, you talk about the jurisdiction authority of the uh, energy regulator, and um, uh, I would like if you could go further in detail about the California example you explain about how uh, the things they are doing, doing in, in California to implement the, the laws in climate change. Sure, thank you. Uh, it is an um, important uh, issue, I think, in making sure that uh, a jurisdiction, whether a country or a, a state like California, has an integrated approach. And uh, uh, from what I understand of, of, of the California legislation, uh, 
it, it does promote integration in that different agencies such as the uh, California Energy Commission, the California Public Utilities Commission, uh, the Air Resources Board, CARB, um, are all pulling in the same direction and, and are all on track or, or uh, in um, giving effect to the overall policy direction that the state has decided on. Uh, the, the specifics are, are, are not, not, not in my mind, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, this is where you know, we, our legal skills, I think, can contribute to an analysis and to ensuring that there is clarity. Uh, for example, if policymakers uh, are thinking, oh, well, the Energy Commission or the Public Utilities Board will want to do this, we have to ask, well, you know, are they legally empowered to? Can they be legally obliged to give effect to one aspect or another of climate change policy? I'll add that some of these things about constraining what an energy board does or constraining what a minister does are organic, uh, structural, <coughs> quasi-constitutional, yes. and and in that sense they're important, uh, and in that and, in other, and it also uh, perhaps explains why international law veers away from those things. Uh, traditionally, international law has left it to uh, the, the, the states that sign up to deliver in their own way. And for example, in particular, uh, the People's Republic of China uh, does not appreciate being told how to manage its internal affairs. Uh, it says this is our commitment, how we deliver on it is our business. And in truth, it would be hard to generalize about how they go about things and how uh, a civil law country and a common law country go about it too. So um, it, it, it's, it's complicated. Well, thank you very much. I guess we go to the next session. Thanks.